Tony Breeds, who is a software developer at Rackspace and also the project technical lead for the stable branch of OpenStack. So please welcome Tony. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I'd like to start by thanking Aptera and the OpenStack Foundation for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you all. Um, I'll unashamedly admit that this is a presentation in two halves. There is a tenuous link between the first half and the second half, so I'll trust that you all bear, will bear with me there and just let me get, get on with it. I also understand that it's, uh, you know, getting close to afternoon coffee time, so if I see people falling asleep, I've got some hacky sacks here to wake you up. <laughs> um, so who am I? Uh, I'm relatively new to OpenStack. I, my first patch landed uh, in OpenStack about two years ago. I'm totally not new to open source. I started using Linux in the early 90s, not long after Linus released the first kernel. Um, as Tom said, I'm the project team lead for the OpenStack stable uh, branches. Basically what that means is if you're running a released branch of OpenStack and it regresses in a measurable way, that's probably my fault and uh, you've got my email address so feel free to use it. Um, this is our team. They're a fantastic group of people. They're 15 Australians, well 15 Australians and one Kiwi, but they don't hold that against me. Um, as I said, there's 15 upstream developers. Uh, uh, Rackspace RPC specifically does all of its development in the open. We, we commit to the OpenStack Foundation's Git infrastructure and then we pull that back down and, and build our products on top of that. Uh, we have two project team leads uh, in those 15 people. We have 10 core contributors across 10 projects, many more repositories. Does everybody know what I mean when I say project team lead and core contributor? Raise your hands if you would like an explanation. Okay, you don't need one, Tom. Uh, so, um, OpenStack, we talk about it as one thing, but it's really a series of independently run project teams. We've got compute, identity, image, uh, volume, uh, dashboard, et cetera, et cetera. They form the fo uh, foundations of a project, and then within a given project, you might have multiple code repositories. So the compute project has multiple code repositories. There's the server project, which is called Nova, and the client project, which is called Nova Client. Um, so that's the distinction between projects and repositories. A core contributor is, oh, I'll take a step back. Anybody in this room uh, who is a foundation member, and that doesn't, cost, that doesn't cost anything, it's just a few clicks on a website, uh, can contribute code to OpenStack. What a core contributor does is they look at that code and once it's gone through possibly a series of iterations, they say, yep, that's good, we're gonna take that into Nova or whatever the project happens to be, Swift if it's uh, object storage, uh, and then they bless it, and you get two core contributors within a given project. Once they've both agreed that it's good, it goes in. So the core contributors are essentially the guardians of what code you will run. Um, in for a root team member, we're very proud to have one of those. Um, across the OpenStack project base, it all runs on top of foundation provided and donated infrastructure. The infra team are the people who keep that running, and the infra roots are a subset of that infra team, and they have, ac obviously, root access to the infrastructure. So when, as happened a couple of days ago, one of the file systems went bad and nobody could upload logs from the CI system, the infra root team get on there and fix that thing. But we're more than just numbers. Um, simply put, we're 15 open source developers who are committed to open source, open stack, and this part might felt really hokey when I wrote it, but it's true. Uh, we're committed to partnerships with our customers and the OpenStack community. So this is that awkward transition I mentioned earlier. I'd like to explain how we take that, that passion, that commitment, dare I say it, that um, fanatical attitude, uh, and take that from upstream commitments and turn it into value for our clients. So everything starts with a conversation. Um, at Rackspace, we don't hesitate to start a conversation, and if things aren't working out, if we're not a good fit for your technology choices or, uh, or whatever, then the conversation can stop, and that's, you know, it, everything's good. We started with a conversation with this particular client. Uh, they said that they were interested in our private cloud product. 
turns out that when we uh, got into more details, they, our private cloud product is based around virtual machines. They were specifically interested in on-metal performance, so that's not a problem. Uh, OpenStack has an on-metal project. It's called Ironic. Um, so we wrote support inside our RPC product, again, external uh, in the foundation code, uh, to support Ironic. They wanted to be able to continuously deploy new versions of the RPC product as it became necessary, but they wanted to make sure that they had a, a simple and safe rollback mechanism, and currently our RPC product doesn't have that thing. Um, I'll note that the installation of the control plane, does everybody know what I mean when I say control plane? Oh, good. Um, the installation of the cold control plane is kind of out of scope for this project that we're talking about, primarily because that's what RPC does. It's really good at installing and controlling, uh, deploying that control plane. If you're not using RPC, there are plenty of great opportunities inside the OpenStack um, Foundation. There's uh, OpenStack Ansible, Collar, Triple O, Puppet, Chef, your, you can even roll your, you can even use distro packages if you want. Um, one of the key things that allowed us to implement the strategy we did was that the application and their workload could run at a degraded state for a finite period of time, so we leveraged that. So what we did after the discussions and we wrote a bunch of our, uh, our Ansible playbooks for the ironic code was we actually truly got very excited. There were several of us that spent quite a lot of time thinking about this and uh, yeah, we felt like we were actually having fun. Um, the other thing is we partnered with the customer. This is not a, we'll take your requirements, we'll run away for three weeks, six weeks, two months, whatever, and come back to you and say, ta-da, it's fully formed. No, we have daily stand-ups, we have um, regular on-site visits with a client where their workload experts can look at what we've done and say, well, that's not going to work for us, or their DC team can say, actually, the way you've configured your bare metal deploy is great or not great, and we can, again, tweak it. So it really is continuing that conversation. Um, for continuous deployment, there's two fairly simple ideas. You can either do a side-by-side -side DevOps calls that blue-green type deployment, or you can do a rolling upgrade. Because of the nature of the workload, um, we went for the side-by-side -side slash blue-green approach. Um, on top of writing the application that I'm talking about that we all got very excited about, we also developed the continuous integration infrastructure so that when we do contribute this back to the big tent uh, for OpenStack, um, we'll have that infrastructure there. We can integrate it with the infra team and it'll go and other people will be able to use it. And we did this from scratch using an open Apache license. So the scenario is we've got a workload running that can't be interrupted. Like I said, it can, be, it can sustain a level of degradation. Sorry, I stumbled over that word. Um, but it can't be interrupted. The key is that the workload manager is in charge of whether we can take a node or not take a node. We have two control planes running. One of them is currently in charge of the ironic nodes, the infrastructure, and doling out work. And the other one's just sitting there not doing anything. Again, standard blue-green type scenario. So we created this awesome term, the forklift. We like that very much. We're a bit geeky. Um, so the way the process works, when we want to take something from control plane one, move it to control plane two. First of all, like I said, the workload manager ha has a lot of control over this. So we notify the workload manager that one of the nodes in its pool, we'd like to take it away for a short period of time. And we wait for, at that point, the workload manager can say, yep, no problems, you can have that machine, or no, you can't have that machine, or you can have that machine in 10 minutes. It, you know, it's got the control. And depending on what it says, we may either go, oh, we won't use that machine, we'll move on to the next one in the pool or we will just wait. We wait for the workload to complete. Uh, and at that point, we start to uh, save metadata about the node. Actually, some of these steps happen in parallel, but that's not important. And then we do enroll that, uh, that node from the ironic code base inside control plane one. At, so the application, I guess, from step four is when the application workload manager will start to see that the degraded performance that I mentioned. Uh, we then very quickly re-enroll that into control plane two. 
Um, and that does cause a reboot on the node, but that's not problematic because it's not doing anything. Uh, once the node has come back up, we notify the workload manager that it's available and it starts rescheduling work there. Um, and the key thing is we also uh, are continually monitoring the performance of the application and that feeds back into some of the considerations on the next slide. And then basically we're, we repeat that. There's nothing terribly, like I say, it sounds simple when you say it out loud, there's nothing terribly complicated about this. It's pretty well understood blue-green deployment. Um, but at the moment, there isn't an open source product that will do this for you in a way that you can control that is sensitive to your workloads uh, and your business requirements. Um, so this is, of course, that's the simple version. Then we get into considerations. Um, the application needs to be able to add and remove control planes. You know, there's no point having this great tool if you can't create a control plane in it that you want to migrate workloads to or remove one once you've decommissioned it. Um, it's a human-led process, right? So somebody in the uh, client, th uh, their workload team will realize that they want to do this migration from control plane one to control plane two, uh, and then they'll go to the dashboard, click the one-click thing. Um, obviously, the dashboard prevent, uh, provides a progress view of what's going on, where we're at, how many machines are in control plane one, how many are in control plane two, and that feeds back into the monitoring process and a few other things. Things go wrong occasionally, so you need to be able to interact with the system and say, we're not gonna do any forklifts, or we're gonna stop all running forklifts now, let the application quiesce, let the infrastructure quiesce, go through, do some problem analysis, and so on and so forth. There's a slight difference between pausing and locking, but the details aren't super critical. Pausing is, you know, just allowing the, the currently running forklift to complete its phase and then moving, and then not starting any new ones. My previous uh, slide, I show, I walked through the, the forklift process, um, and I very carefully just walked you through one node at a time. You can do as many nodes as you want. You're in control. The level of parallelism you can exploit depends on your, your workload. If your workload can only be without one node at a time, then you just do them serially. If you can lose 10% of your workload, then you can do them in larger chunks. We also, it's a simplifying statement and we may change this in the future, but we made a statement that the workload is not upgraded outside of the forklift process because you don't want to be moving machines from one control plane to another control plane and simultaneously upgrading the code base that those machines are running because when things go pear-shaped, which one of those two changes that you were doing was the root cause, which one do you back out, which one do you not back out, et cetera, et cetera. This application sits on top of an entire, it sits on top of uh, stable OpenStack APIs, uh, not product APIs. So if you're using an OpenStack cloud anywhere, this product will work for you. Obviously, it's a fairly new product. Um, but it'll work for anybody. And our current use case is ironic based, but that's just because that's where we wanted to go. It's nothing that's inherently ironic specific. The biggest open question we have at the moment is which endpoints do OpenStack clients then use? If you want to create or interrogate the list of running instances inside your control plane and you're halfway between migrating from control plane one to control plane two, uh, which endpoint do you talk to? Do you ask um, glance on CP1 or do you ask glance on CP2? So the product controls that um, the current thinking, at the moment it's not critical, but the current thinking is that um, the product will control that by using Nginx and sitting as a proxy front end to the OpenStack API. So the client will always use a single endpoint and then based on the state of the application migration, the current forklifts, the capacity within each of the two control planes, uh, the product will uh, allow Nginx to talk to one or the other. 
control planes. So I've gone a little bit faster than I thought I would. Uh, it probably happens because I'm nervous. So what I wanted to show you was that uh, here at Rackspace Australia, we have a team that is very strongly committed to upstream OpenStack. We develop in the clear, we, de we partner with our, our clients, uh, and we are genuinely excited and uh, challenged by that process. Um, I wanted to show you how we take that commitment to open source and OpenStack and translate it into value and give back to the community at large. It's not all about, I mean, we could have taken this uh, deployment technology and kept it in-house and used it as a competitive advantage, but we see that there's value in giving it back to the community uh, so that other people can enhance it, learn from it, grow from it, because ultimately, it's my belief, I'm a software engineer, so I could be wrong, um, that the workload is your competitive advantage and OpenStack is just a tool that you use to facilitate that workload. So, you know, you don't need to keep OpenStack a secret. Uh, like I said earlier, we're gonna contribute this back to the OpenStack Foundation as part of the Big Tent. It's not there yet um, because we're still in the rapid development phase and for better or worse, the Garrett workflow that we use in the community can be a little bit slowing at times. Uh, and that um, it's built from the ground up using established OpenStack community practices and paradigms. So we, as community participants, we know how to interact with the community. We know how to, um, we know how the community thinks in a lot of ways. It's, it's a large community, right? So I don't pretend to speak for everyone. And it's built, uh, our product is built for OpenStack by an OpenStack team. Thank you. We've got plenty of time for questions, if there are any. Indeed we do. Who would like to start off? Uh, okay, so one's called Rackspace Public Cloud, one's called Rackspace Private Cloud. Uh, no, no. Uh, more seriously, our private cloud um, is, it's a reference architecture built using OpenStack components. Um, it's based on the current stable branch, so our latest product offering, actually we haven't released the Mataka product yet, so uh, the latest one that you can use will be based on the Liberty code base. Our public cloud offering is, um, it tracks master, so our compute nodes could be anywhere between two days and four weeks behind the master branch of OpenStack Nova. The different options in terms of our image storage, our volume storage and so forth, our networking, they may, they track master also, but they may be closer or further behind than, no, than the compute layer because we deploy them separately. But essentially, it's OpenStack all the way. So you use OpenStack APIs if you're running clients, and it doesn't matter if you're talking to public cloud or private cloud, they should just work. So I think what I heard was a public cloud offering is more of a day. Yes. Okay, Who would like to ask a question of Tony? I don't like talking to these things, but I'm talking to it anyway. <laughs> so if, is it right to say that what you offer is a, a supported whole stack of, of what your product is? is uh, uh, yes. And is it possible to take a, a version of that which is unsupported or like? Um, Absolutely, you can use the community uh, OpenStack Ansible project, which is essentially what RPC is based on and deploy it yourself without any support arrangements with any vendor. Is it possible to download it and then have support added onto that? No, you would have, if you wanted to commence a support arrangement, then we'd have to start with an RPC base and go from there. And I'm asking lots of questions. I was That's fine, I'm happy to things. answer questions. So the, what about the, uh, the the hosting of it? What sort of, um, is it, do you host it on on-premise hypervisors? 
if there was such a thing, or was it all on your own? No, 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 we, setup? RPC can be run in your data center wherever you are in the world, or it can be run uh, using dedicated hardware in our public cloud infrastructure. All good answers. Are there more good questions? A lot of people came up from the basement just for this talk. <laughs> Did it meet your expectations, or are you just really looking forward to that coffee? Another question over here. So with what you presented on around what you've called forklift, Yep. that was based on using ironic and physical hardware, so moving a workload between hardware from what I could tell there. Sure. It seems like you're leading towards using it to move workloads between potentially uh, two OpenStack deployments. Yes. That's the idea, that's what's coming. That's certainly cool. one use for it. Okay, cool. Anyone else want to ask questions? Uh, back over here. I've got another question since that's someone cool. else is asking. Um, I'm much better than questions than presentations. You, you did all right. Um, in terms of setting up that on-prem private cloud offering, sure. What's can you give us an idea around the timelines that would typically sort of involve, like, and, and sort of the steps? I guess the steps and the timelines. No, I'm sorry, that's not something I've ever been involved in. Um, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'll go for a walk. Oh uh, yeah, come come down and talk to. Uh, actually, Linton's not here. He'd be the best person to talk to. Uh, it's a question of scale, right? If we're talking about five nodes, um, then you'd probably spend longer engaging Rackspace in the contract negotiation phase than you would do with the deployment. Um, if we're talking about 300 nodes, then that, that balance tips in the other direction. Indeed, any other further questions here? I'm sure answering questions is something that's integral to the Rackspace mission. They have <laughs> this concept of fanatical support. And that's so right. once uh, they're offering some free accounts on the public cloud for developers, and you sign in with all of your information, and then immediately your phone rings, and it says, hi, welcome to Rackspace. It's a real person <laughs> who's calling just to welcome you. It's uh, pretty incredible. If you compare between uh, public cloud for, uh, from Rackspace compared to Amazon, uh, what is the price? Yeah. I can't talk about pricing. Like I said, I'm a software engineer. I want to ask me about Python, I can help you there. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah. Come, come talk to us at the booth. The booth has all of the answers, uh, not just the technical answers. Just, that's right. Yeah. Really, that's fantastic. How are we feeling? Uh, any ready more for questions? No, I think, I think they're really ready for coffee. Should right. we let them go? Sure. Okay, let's thank Tony Breeds again. <laughs>